Well, hello, everybody. Um, this is the next set of notes. We're going to be talking about speed and velocity. So when we're talking about things that are changing, uh, we have to come up with some concept of how to measure the amount of uh, interval between those changes. Uh, we're so used to talking about time it's become sort of a, a funny point with physicists because we don't know what time really means. Humans will talk about clocks and uh, the ticking of time, but we actually don't understand time. We don't know why it exists or what it really is. So we've come up with this concept of uh, a sequence of events and there are things in the universe that seem to take a certain amount of time always. They don't seem to change from our point of view. Uh, so for example, um, the earth spins on its axis, so we have 24 hours in a day. Uh, so we could devise a system of using the, the rotation of the earth spin to come up with a way of measuring an amount of time interval which we did for quite a while as a, a, a species. But now in science, we want to be very precise, as precise as we can get. And so we have a new standard, or at least we've had a standard for a while, based on an atom's uh, transition between energy levels. So we count a certain number of times that an atom will transition between two different states. And for a given count of those transitions, we call that one second. Um, so that's time. Uh, it sounds odd, but we act, in physics, we don't actually know what time is. We, when you measure things with our senses, uh, we have a sense for things that happen quickly or happen slowly. And so there's this idea of a rate of change. And in science, then, we use our definition of a second to define the interval of time that we would watch over. And we've come up with the second. Um, and when things change, it's a rate change per second. For position, the rate change of position with respect to the second is known as velocity. So we say that velocity is equal to displacement divided by the time interval it took for that displacement to happen. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you see the definition for velocity, and it's using delta x, which would be the change in position, divided by delta t, which would be the change in time. And we can also refer to things moving with speed. The only difference in physics between velocity and speed is that velocity uses displacement where we talk about the change in position, whereas speed uses distance, which would be the path length during the, the movement. Displacement also has direction to it so that we use displacement almost exclusively in physics instead of distance, because if you don't uh, take care of knowing about the directions that things are occurring, you'll more than likely get the answer wrong, especially later on when we get into accelerations and things traveling in two dimensions instead of just along a straight line. So velocity is defined by displacement over time, where displacement is a vector, so velocity is a vector. It includes the direction. And speed is defined as distance over time, where distance doesn't include a direction. It uses path length. Both of them use units of meters per second. Uh, if you were traveling in one direction, and you never change that direction, the size of your displacement would be the same as the size of your distance. As soon as you change direction, then the two deviate from each other. They're not the same anymore. And remember that uh, 
delta means change in, and that's defined as final minus initial. So delta x, or change in position, is final position minus initial position. Delta t would be final time minus initial time. Uh, looking at average velocity and average speed, it's a bad idea to do numerical averages like you might do in math. So if you had two different velocities and you wanted to know your average velocity, don't just add the two velocities together and divide by two. Or if you have three velocities, adding the three velocities together and dividing by three, that'll more than likely be wrong. And it's because when you do it, that average, it's assuming that each number has the same amount of impact on the average. But usually when you're doing average velocities, you've traveled at different, the different velocities for different amounts of time. So if you traveled really slowly for an hour and then traveled really fast for one second, your average velocity isn't the midpoint between those two velocities. It's very close to the very slow velocity because you traveled at that speed for a very long amount of time compared to the fast velocity. So the better way to do it to find average velocity or average speed is to take total displacement divided by total time or total distance divided by total time if you're using speed. So I'll show you an example of that. So let's just say for a simple example, you're traveling at 30 kilometers per hour for two hours and then 40 kilometers per hour for one hour. If you did a mathematical average where you just added the two numbers together and divided by two, you'd end up with 70 divided by two, where the two comes from the number of numbers you used. You have a 30 and a 40, so you have two numbers. And that ends up with an answer of 75 or 35 as an average. 70 divided by 2. But that's incorrect. That's not the true average. You've traveled at 30 kilometers per hour for longer, so your average should be closer to 30 kilometers per hour. So instead, you figure out how far you traveled during the first part of the trip. So 30 kilometers per hour for two hours means going 60 kilometers. And then you traveled 40 kilometers per hour for one hour. So it's 60 kilometers plus 40 kilometers, which is a total of 100 kilometers. And then you divide by the total amount of time, which is three hours. So 100 kilometers divided by three hours is 33 kilometers per hour or close to it. So you should do it that way. If you're doing an average velocity or an average speed, don't just add them together and divide by the number of numbers. Find total displacement and then divide by total time. And there'll be an example of that on the test. You will be checked to see if you do it the right way. If you're given a position versus time graph, change in position would be the change of the value on the y-axis. And we would call that the rise for that uh, graph. And then change in time, the time interval, would be the change along the x-axis. So if we do change in position divided by change in time, that's like saying take rise divided by run. And rise over run is slope. So on a position versus time graph, the slope of the graph tells you the velocity of the object. A constant velocity graph would be a straight line because the object would have the same slope for the entire trip. It's a constant velocity. And then the units for velocity would be the units of the rise divided by the units of the run, so meters divided by seconds. And that gives us the units for velocity. With a constant velocity graph, you'll end up with a straight line. The equation for a line is from math, y equals mx plus b. And there's other ways of writing it. Some people will write it as y equals ax plus b, but it's a general form. Now, what do these variables get replaced with on our particular graph? 
Well, the Y stands for the vertical axis. And on our vertical axis, it's position. So the Y gets replaced with X because we're using X to represent how far horizontally the object is traveled. And then on the equation for the line, X is the horizontal axis. But on our horizontal axis, it's time. So we replace the X with T. And then slope, we've already talked about, the M gets replaced with velocity for this graph. And then finally, the last thing at the end here, this is known as the y-intercept. It would be where the graph hits the y-axis. And from a physics point of view, that's when our time is equal to zero. So we replace this b, the y-intercept, with the concept of position at time equals zero, or x sub i, the initial position. So the equation of a line gets turned into our equation of constant velocity motion. Position equals velocity times time from zero plus your initial position at time equals zero. So this is our very first physics equation right here. Now I'd like you to figure out what is the equation of motion for this particular graph. It's an object that's moving, and I want you to use the idea of a line, but convert the parts that you can into the equation of motion. So you should replace the m, because you can actually figure out what the slope is, and you should replace the b. You can just read that right off the graph. What is the y-intercept? So you'll end up with x equals some velocity times t plus some value for the initial position. So please do that now. So you should have gotten x equals 0.5 meters per second. Always put the units on the number times t plus a beginning position of five meters when we were at t equals zero. Uh, in the classroom, we've had the Sonic Rangers out for quite some time now, and we've been using carts. So you should have a concept now of how to look at a graph and decide what the object must be doing to make that graph. So here's some more practice with that. If you're given a position versus time graph that looks like this one up here, what must the cart be doing to make this graph? And the answer is that it has to be moving away from the sensor at a constant speed. Okay, let's do another one. So this middle one here on the right-hand side, what must the cart be doing to make that graph? So the cart would have to start at some distance away from the sensor and then be moving towards it. Now finally, the last one at the bottom here on the left, what would the cart have to be doing to make that graph? So it'd be sitting stationary at some point away from the sensor, like about halfway down the track. Okay, this would be similar to a question on the test. So choose the correct position versus time graph for the given explanation or given description of motion. So we have a person that starts one meter away from the Sonic Ranger and walks away from the Sonic Ranger slowly and steadily for four seconds. They stop for three seconds, and then they walk fast back towards the Sonic Ranger for the last three seconds. Which of these position versus time graphs would be the best choice? So it's A, you start near the sensor, but away from it. Uh, then you travel at a constant speed away from the sensor. So you're going up the graph. Then you stop, so you have to be flat, no velocity. And then finally you have to walk rapidly back. So that means steep, 
and it has to be heading down because you're heading back towards the sensor. Now we've been talking about average velocity. Now we're going to talk about instantaneous velocity. So if you're in a car and you look at the speedometer, you see the speed at that moment in time. And the speedometer will likely change as you continue to watch. It's not changing because it's recalculating a new average as you've changed your speeds. And it's actually just telling you how fast you're going at that moment. It doesn't remember anything about what happened before. So that's instantaneous. It's the speed at that moment in time or that velocity at that moment in time. Uh, to calculate an instantaneous or average velocity or instantaneous speed or instantaneous velocity, uh, you would do the same calculation. It's change in position over change in time, but it has to be at a given moment in time. So the interval of time has to be shrunk down to be a single moment, which is essentially not an interval of time. It goes to zero. The t delta t becomes zero. And any number divided by zero is infinity. So from that point of view, it should be impossible to calculate an instantaneous velocity or instantaneous speed. But there are mathematical ways to do it. And if you get into calculus, if you continue in math and you learn about the mathematics of change, then you'll find the tools to be able to handle this situation. For now, in physics, we're going to look at it from a graphical point of view, from looking at a position versus time graph. So if you're given a straight line position versus time graph, the instantaneous velocity at any time would be the same because constant velocity, it's always the same velocity. So you just find the slope of the graph and you've got the instantaneous velocity for every time. So this only becomes more difficult or a, a different concept when your velocity is changing. And you want to find the slope of the graph, but just at the particular time that you want. So if you wanted to know how fast this object was traveling at one second, you'd want to find the slope of this position time graph right at one second. And that's now using a tangent line. So you draw a tangent line in, and you find the slope of that tangent line, the place where that line touches the graph just at that one point. These other lines here are average velocities. They're taking an interval of time that's not zero. So the very first one, this one down here, is using the interval from zero to two seconds. And it's an average then. It would be traveling from zero meters to about 27 meters in a time of two seconds. And then the next one, you're getting a smaller interval of time, maybe from 0.25 seconds up to about 1.8 seconds, but it's still not zero interval, and therefore it's still an average. And all of these are average velocities. If you wanted to find the instantaneous velocity at a different time, you'd have to draw a new tangent line and then find the slope of that tangent line. So over here, the instantaneous velocity at about 2.6 seconds would be zero. The tangent line would be flat at about 2.6 seconds. The same would be true at about 1.5 seconds. The tangent line would be flat and therefore the object is stopped at this time in its trip. All right, so to find the instantaneous velocity, you want to find the slope of the tangent line at that time. So let's do a few examples. We have this position versus time graph of a bird. The bird flies towards zero, wherever zero is, and then suddenly reverses direction and flies away. 
What's the bird's instantaneous velocity at five seconds? So we'll find the slope of the tangent line right at five seconds. So here's five seconds. I'll go up. It's this point right here. I would put a tangent line in, but it's on a line already that's not curving here. It's just a straight constant velocity line. So I'll use this whole line and calculate the average velocity for this part of the trip. And then the instantaneous velocities all along that part of the trip would be the same. So I'll use rise of negative 20 meters and a run of 10 meters or 10 seconds. So negative 20 meters in 10 seconds is a slope of negative two meters per second. So that means right here is also a slope of negative two meters per second. Now at 15 seconds, I would want to find the tangent line here, but it's a straight line, constant velocity. So I'll use the entire segment. I go up 15 meters and over 15 seconds. So 15 meters divided by 15 seconds, this segment has a slope of one meter per second. So at 15 seconds, it also has a slope of one meter per second. And then finally, for 20 seconds, the slope of the tangent line is the same. It's still on the same line segment. So the slope here would still be one meter per second. Okay, the next set of questions are for average velocity and average velocity requires a time interval. So we'll start from zero and go to 10 seconds. Well, we've already done this. We had to do it to get the instantaneous velocities. So we have a rise of negative 20 and a run of 10 seconds. So this would be negative 20 divided by 10 or negative two, the average velocity for this part of the trip. Uh, for the next part of the trip, again, we've already figured out the slope of this line. So it's a rise of 15 and a run of 15. So it's 15 meters divided by 15 seconds, and that's one meter per second. And then finally, the new part of this, what's the interval or what's the average velocity starting here at zero and going all the way to the end? So we're going to use the displacement of negative five meters divided by the time interval of 25 seconds and negative five divided by 25 is negative 0.2 meters per second. So notice in this case, the average velocity for the entire trip is not the same as the numerical average of these two numbers. If we took the numerical average, we would get negative whatever, but it's not negative 0.2. It would be negative 0.5. So it's not the same. Okay, the next set of questions, find the average speed. This uses path length. So it may be the same as the displacement over time, but only if we don't turn. So for the first part of the trip, it goes from zero seconds to 10 seconds, and it travels a distance of 20 meters. So it's 20 meters divided by 10 seconds. So it's two meters per second. Notice the missing negative sign, because we don't care about direction when we're talking about speed. All right, from 10 seconds to 25 seconds, uh, we do a distance of 15 meters and a time of 15 seconds. So 15 meters divided by 15 seconds is one meter per second. So in this case, it's the same as the average velocity for the same interval. And now finally, for the full duration of the trip, we have a distance of 20 plus another distance of 15 for a total distance of 35. 
and that's 35 meters in a total of 25 seconds. So 35 meters divided by 25 seconds, we get 1.4 meters per second average speed, which is significantly different than our average velocity. All right, some more examples. This are, these I'm gonna ask you to do. So what is the velocity, and this is gonna be average velocity, for the first line segment? for segment A. All right, so you'd wanna do rise over run, two meters divided by one second, and that's two meters per second. All right, please do B. What's the average velocity for this time? All right, so rise over run is zero over one second, so it's just zero meters per second. Uh, please do C. And if we see, we go up one meter over one second, and that's one meter per second. And then finally, D, we get negative 1.5 meters per second. All right, last one, I believe. We have a bus trip. This is the plot of its position versus time. It starts at 20 kilometers, so we could say that the school is at 20 kilometers on the highway and the center of town is at zero. So what is the final displacement of the bus? This is at the end of the trip. The answer is plus 10 kilometers. So we started at 20, we ended at 30. So as a total trip, we went up by 10 kilometers. Okay, what's the instantaneous velocity at three hours? At the three hour mark, we're on this part of the graph. So we would find the slope of this and it would be down 30 and a run of three hours. So minus 30 kilometers divided by three hours with minus kilometers per hour, which is a very slow bus. And then the average velocity over the first three hours of zero kilometers per hour. The displacement is zero. Thank you for watching.